So everybody enjoying themselves so far? 170 something people, so not so bad. Um, my presentation today is going to be over using something called uh, Bridge Control Protocol. And what we're going to do is to create some layer two networks over the internet. And I have a specific application that um, I want to show you that we actually use this for, and it works quite well. Uh, first of all, just a little bit about me. My name is Steve Disher. I'm from College Station, Texas. College Station is about uh, an hour and 15 minutes north of Houston. So if you know where Houston is, uh, that's about it. I've been a Microtech trainer since 2008. Uh, I have been using the product since about 2003, 2004, something like that. So quite a long time. Uh, I have a blog, and uh, it's stevedisher.com, my name. Funny how that works. I also have a book called Router OS by Example, and I have a wireless distribution company we operate called ISP Supplies, and there's about the book again. I have a book, by the way. Did I mention that? All right. So listen up, because there's going to be prizes. Um, yes, I, that's kind of a cheap way to get people to stay in the room and listen to your talk, but uh, I really don't care, because I have some good prizes for you. And uh, so pay very close attention to the slides and what we talk about so you can be the lucky winner. So here's the problem I want to define, or at least a problem that we have from time to time, and that is multiple locations that are separated by some kind of internet connectivity. Maybe it's a cable modem, maybe it's fiber on one end, doesn't really matter. But we want to create a layer two tunnel between the two locations. And this kind of sounds like old news, right? But I want to show you a way that I've started using that is actually quite easy. It's even easier than the old EOIP tunnels that I used to use. And uh, it gives you a lot of advantages. So first of all, why do you need a layer two tunnel? Well, if you want to have a centralized DHCP server and have it serve multiple locations, then you've got to have a tunnel. If you want to use Roman, which is Microtik's uh, monitoring slash management program, which is actually really cool, I like it, doesn't require any routing, then you're going to need a layer two tunnel. Other services, like if you have a voice over IP system that uses something called zero config, Grandstream is one that uh, has that service. Uh, you can knock Grandstream if you want to. I like it, but that's me. Anyway, you need layer two. So a lot of applications that layer two is a necessity. Here's some differences, and I borrowed this slide from another trainer, uh, from another mum somewhere, but I thought it did a good job. The differences between layer two and layer three VPN. So layer two, first of all, all sites share the same LAN subnet. So that makes routing easier because there is no routing, right? We're all on the same subnet. Uh, the broadcast domain is end-to-end -end everywhere. We can have a centralized DHCP server, simplifies the network. It almost seems like we're going backwards, the whole, uh, you know, we're going to go bridge to route it, well, now we're going to go route it back to bridge. Well, I'm not talking about going crazy here with layer two, just when it is the most appropriate thing. We can also have a centralized internet gateway and uh, it is based on bridging, so there's no routing required. On the other side of the uh, box there, the site-to-site -site layer three VPN, each side would of course have a different LAN IP subnet. Broadcasts are not possible. We have to have probably DHCP server at both sites, and um, we have to have a different internet gateway at both sites, and have to have either static routing or dynamic routing. Or more important, maybe we have an application that requires layer two functionality. And that's why we're doing this little presentation. So the go-to option in router OS for me has always been EOIP. A couple of years ago, they had an announcement that the EOIP tunnel function was, I think, 17 years old or something like that. And they were adding IPsec after 17 years, which was pretty neat. But uh, it's always been kind of my go-to item. Typically, you have to have both ends with public IPs in order to establish the EOIP tunnel. If you don't have public IPs, then you end up building a tunnel over a tunnel and it gets fairly complex. So I wanted a way to do it that was a little bit easier. Of course, when you do tunnels over tunnels, you have additional packet overhead and additional configuration steps. 
It's also harder to configure and harder to maintain. It does not lend itself well to road warriors or remote workers that may be changing locations. So this is kind of a typical network, a hub and spoke type technology or topology where in the center of the network we have HQ, headquarters, that's our office building we'll say. And then we have a diverse set of remote locations. It might be a single laptop, it might be a network of computers, it might be someone working from their home. And uh, so this is a fairly common application. So this is what we're going to look at today using bridge control protocol. To complete a hub and spoke configuration like this, we need several technologies. And I don't ever like to just say words and acronyms and things like that without defining what they are. So first I'll list them and then we'll go through and define what each one does. First of all, we're going to need some kind of a tunneling protocol and we're going to use L2TP for that. We're going to need bridging. Bridging's pretty obvious. Uh, if you want to bridge two dissimilar interfaces, you're going to need bridging. And then we're going to need BCP, which is the bridge control protocol. And then one more thing that I didn't really understand when I first started doing this, and that is we have to have a way to make things all work correctly in the background. And Microtik has that already for you, and it's called multi-link PPP. It's actually really old. So the concepts that we're going to use, sorry. The concepts that we're going to use, first of all, bridging. Bridging is simply the ability to join together two dissimilar interfaces into one logical interface. Bridges behave a lot like switches, and after version 6.41, they actually have the ability to offload traffic to the onboard switch chip. So if you have a router that has the onboard switch chip, there's no longer setting a master interface. I don't know if you've noticed that. You don't have to take Ethernet 2 and make it the master, and then slave 3, 4, and 5, and so on with a switch chip. Now you just simply create a bridge interface add all of those physical interfaces to the bridge, and it automatically offloads to the hardware switch chip. So that was quite an improvement. Bridging over a layer three network is useful anytime you want to extend layer two services from one point to another, especially when you don't control the network in between, such as the internet. Bridge control protocol is specific to PPP. It lends itself well to the hub and spoke network of arrangements, so it's quite easily built. Clients can have static or dynamic IP addresses. We don't need to know their IP addresses in advance. The tunnels can be created by remote devices on the fly, and they can also go away when the client goes away. And what I'm going to show you is a single step configuration. It's not a tunnel over a tunnel. And we have the ability to provide not only encryption like we do with IPsec and EOIP, but we can also provide authentication for the tunnel itself, so a little bit more security. Now, you might be asking, I don't see BCP in Winbox anywhere. I've looked through all the buttons, it's not there. That's because it is auto-magical. Router OS does all the heavy lifting for you in the background simply by creating a PPP profile with the right settings in it. The other technology we're going to use for this setup is multi-link PPP. Now, this is old school. I mean, how many of you can remember ISDN? Okay, yeah, well, more than probably a few. Uh, I'll never forget when we got ISDN at our office. We thought, man, I mean, that was basically the equivalent of getting, uh, you know, 10 gig nowadays. So that was a big deal. But uh, I digress. Multi-link PPP is, actually comes from RFC 1990 and it was originally created for ISDN networks. However, it does have its application for what we're going to do today. It is a method of splitting, recombining, and sequencing data across multiple logical data links, or in our case, over a single PPP link. So quite simply, why do we need it? Well, a layer two tunnel going over a layer three network is going to require that we actually transmit ethernet over a layer three network and over this tunnel. When you take the tunnel MTU plus any overhead, it can't pass a whole frame. So we have to have a way to get the data through the tunnel in pieces in the right order and then reassemble it on the other side. 
and that's what multi-link PPP does for us. It fragments and then it reassembles the packets and if we don't have it, some things are going to break. Now, I've, I've figured this out from personal experience. Things like voice over IP, I had a very, very strange um, situation. Jonathan, he's in the room. Jonathan was the guinea pig for this. Uh, Jonathan works from home. He had a voice over IP phone. We had a layer two tunnel back to our office. Jonathan could sometimes make local calls, but he could never make international calls. So I put in a ticket, of course, with Grandstream. I'm like, look, there's a problem with the PBX. We went through a lot of troubleshooting. It wasn't until we started doing packet captures and we figured out what was happening was packet fragmentation. So once we turn on multi-link PPP, and that's another one that's a little bit tricky, there's not a checkbox, which I've already complained about, and support said, well, why do you want a checkbox? But anyway, um, once we turn on MLPPP, suddenly you can make international calls. Uh, another strange issue we've noticed with fragmentation on L2 tunnels is DHCP not working correctly. So there's a multitude of application level problems that you can see if you don't have the tunnel working correctly. So that's what I'm going to show you today. We can configure router OS to split the tunnel into multiple logical tunnels over a single link and then combine them back together on the other side and transmit the full frame. So once again, you might say, hmm, I don't see multi-link PPP anywhere. You are correct. It's not right there where you can see it. Once again, Router OS does a heavy lifting for us in the background if you set something called the MRRU setting on the L2TP server. So basically, it's an on-off thing. If you don't put in a value for MRRU, it doesn't do multi-link PPP. If you put a value in there, it says, oh, he wants to do MLPPP, and so it starts working. What is MRRU, the Maximum Receive Reconstructive Unit? It's similar to the MTU, but it applies only to multi-link bundles. It's the maximum packet size, the multi-link interface can process, 1600 is the default value. So if you simply put 1600 in the blank, once again, it automatically works. So let's go back to our example network, hub and spoke topology. There are two pieces that we have to configure. It doesn't matter if we have a remote network, a remote laptop, a remote single client in a home. It doesn't matter. There's two pieces. There's the HQ or the center of the hub and spoke, and there's a remote location. For the HQ, there's five steps we have to do. First of all, we have to create a bridge interface. That's really simple. You click bridge, plus sign, OK. Next, you have to add your LAN interface to the bridge. So for instance, if I have my phone connected to Ethernet 2, I'll put Ethernet 2 on the bridge. Then we create a PPP profile. Uh, PPP profiles are found on the PPP button on the profile tab, and I'll show you all this in a moment. And you create a new profile, and in the profile, you tell it to put that profile on a bridge, whatever bridge you created. Fourth, you create a PPP secret. The secret is just the username and password combination. And by the way, all these slides will be posted on the website, so if you miss something, uh, the step-by-step -step will be there for you. And then lastly, you're going to enable the L2TP VPN server and you're going to turn on multi-link PPP with the uh, setting that I'll show you. On the remote side, for the clients, four steps. Create the bridge, add the LAN interface to the bridge, create a PPP profile with the bridge in the profile, and create the L2TP client with multi-link PPP. Why? Why do we want to do this? Well. Let's go through a case study. In, in our case, it was uh, our company, ISP Supplies. We had been using free PBX for a lot of years with a multitude of different phones. Uh, as a Grandstream reseller, we saw the value that uh, Grandstream's zero config function would provide for us. And if you're not familiar, zero config, when you have it set up properly, simply means you take a phone out of a box, you assemble it, you plug it in, the phone pops up in the window, you tell it what extension that phone is going to be. It pushes a model template, a global template, 
a firmware upgrade. It tells it a path where it's going to download and upgrade firmware in the future. What color you want the LCD screen to be. I mean, you name it, it all gets pushed to the phone. Even the SIP username and the SIP password gets pushed to the phone with a fairly complex password. So it makes provisioning phones really simple. We wanted to be able to use that, but you can't use it over layer three network. You have to have an L2 L yeah, a layer two tunnel. We have five different workers in our company that work from home. So we needed a way to deploy this in a uniform way that worked every time and gave us a good result. In our requirement, our PBX was located behind a Microtik router and firewall. Some of the phones we had were actually in our office, so they were on the same switch, the same local area network. Other phones were in remote locations with various ISPs. And again, the whole idea of necessitating L2 functionality was so we could use this zero config. And as I said before, it provides for you automatic provisioning, pushes model specific or global templated configs to the phone, as well as any updates. And that's what the screen looks like in the UCM, the uh, Grandstream PBX. And all of those are phones that have been discovered by zero config and all I did was click the little button where you see the arrow, assign the extension, click OK, and you're done. After that, the phone just reboots three or four times and it's ready to go. This is what our network looks like in the dude. Uh, you see the up in the upper left in that red box, those are the remote uh, locations all dialing into our VPN concentrator. At each of the remote sites, we put uh, a HAP light as well as a Grandstream GXP2140 phone with the extension module. I like that phone because you can uh, dynamically assign extensions to it using the event list. It works really well. Back at the HQ location, we have a RB1100 AHX2. Uh, probably today we have a different router. You know how it is, the shoemaker's kids have no shoes. Well. Our office routers are usually whatever comes back as an RMA and we fix it and then it gets put in the rack and then it dies and we get another one off the RMA shelf. But anyway, I digress. And then we have the uh, Grandstream UCM 68, uh, 6208 uh, as our PBX connected to it. This is what we wanted to accomplish. Notice on the left side, these are all the remote workers. Oh, I got a little pointer here. Okay, so these are all the remote workers. Each one has a computer and they have a phone and then they have the HAP light here. So what we wanted to do was to take whatever ports these devices are plugged into and put them on the same L2 segment as the phones in our office network. So to accomplish that, this is what the setup looks like step by step. And again, you'll have these slides so you can go home and you can uh, reconstruct this for yourself. Step one is you're going to create the bridge for the local area network at the headquarters, the center of the hub and spoke. The PBX will connect to this bridge on a physical ethernet port as well as any phones you might have. Secondly, you're going to add any uh, other local ports that you want to be on that bridge. Thirdly, you're going to create a PPP profile. Now here's where part of the magic happens. In the PPP profile, you can put a default bridge. You do not need a local address or a remote address. In fact, there's no addressing even needed if you're creating an L2 tunnel. There's no need for it. So you just put in the name of the bridge where you want these L2 TP clients to attach to. Fourth, create a PPP secret. You can either use one for each user that's going to be dialing in, which is Probably the preferred method because that way if somebody's not connected, you know who's not connected. I'm a little lazier and so I just use the same username and password for every single phone that's dialing in or router that's dialing in for the phone. In the PPP secret is where you can also put the profile, which in this case is pulling what bridge is going to attach that user to. Lastly, at the headquarters, you're going to enable L2TP server. It's very simple in router OS. You click the PPP box and you check the button there that says L2TP server, set it to enabled. And if you want to use IPsec, you can put in the secret here. Now, 
This is another one of the magic settings. By default, this is grayed out, this MRRU setting. All you have to do is just click the little down arrow. It looks like this by default. You just click the down arrow. The default value is 1600. That's what auto magically enables multi-link PPP. That was a step that I kept missing. On the remote end, this in this case would be the HAP lights. You're going to create the bridge interface. You're going to put the Ethernet ports on that bridge. You're going to create a PPP profile for the inbound tunnel, uh, outbound tunnel, and you're going to specify what bridge you want to put that on at the remote end. And again, if you're using uh, IPsec, you'll put in an IPsec secret here and check the box. The connect to, this is going to be the IP address of the headquarters router, or as I'll show you later, you can use IP cloud and a dynamic DNS name. The username and the password, and you click OK. At that point, the tunnel is going to come up, and whatever ports you've assigned at the remote end are going to be on the same layer two network as the office. And if we check in with our UCM, our Grandstream PBX, we see that there is a phone that has appeared and it has no extension uh, assigned to it. So that's the zero config function. It has reported back to the PBX, here I am, assign me, and we assign an extension and everything else happens in the background. This is uh, our router at the headquarters and you can see all the um, L2TP clients that have dialed in here. The username is uh, displayed for you. And then you also see that each of those ports has been added to the bridge. What if my device has a dynamic IP at my headquarters? Not a problem because if you haven't found IP Cloud, to me it's one of the cooler things that Router OS does. With IP Cloud, you check the box that says dynamic DNS enabled, you click OK, and it's going to figure out its public IP address and then you'll be able to log into that device remotely or build a tunnel to it or whatever you want to do through the serial number .sn.mynetname.net, as you can see there. So if you don't have a static IP, not a problem, use IP Cloud. All right. Fairly short, fairly simple. This is one of those presentations you don't even have to sit in for. All you have to do is get the slides and follow it step by step and it'll work. So I want to make it more exciting. So we're going to have some prizes. So I, before I left College Station, I went down the shelves and I picked up some of my favorite items and we're going to give them away as prizes and the value of the prize will depend upon the complexity of the question. The first person I see that raises their hand with the correct answer gets the prize. No fighting, don't get mad at me if I don't see you. Question number one, what color shirt was I wearing today? Right there, right there, Glenn. Red, all right, good job, Glenn. Glenn, you get a woobum. How many people know what the woobum does? I'm not talking about the thing that makes babies. The woobum, not the womb. Okay, it's really cool, you should try it out. It's a little USB dongle that you put into the USB port of your router. It broadcasts an SSID, you connect to it, you web browse to 192.168.4.1, and it gives you a serial console into your router. So it's a really cool little device. It can also be uh, a wireless client. It can be a number of things. All right, so the correct answer is red. They get harder now. I have a layer two tunnel connected, but SIP is acting strange. I'm not looking yet. I can't dial international calls. Sometimes local calls don't go through. DHCP is not working. What is wrong? Right here. What? And how do I fix it? I, I, I'm gonna help him, because I, I know he knows. M? Yes, you're right there. Watch your eye, there you go, all right. Good job, yes, you have to have the MRRU set to 1600 to make multi-link PPP work. Next one, where do you assign the bridge for the L2TP tunnel? Back row, blue shirt, in the PPP profile, all right, that's easy. Woobum, I don't know if I can do it, so watch your eyes. Oh, good catch. 
If it doesn't work, RMA it. We need another Woobum at the office. Okay, on the PPP profile. I'm going to hand deliver from now on. The flooring is not working. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> what color was the auto magical graphic on the slide? Yes, sir. You're right. And another Woobum. Somebody pass that back. Yes. All right, two prizes left. What is the name of the function in PPP that splits the data and reassembles it according to RFC 1990 and is enabled when you set the MRU? All right, right here. Multi-link PPP. All right, you got to catch it. Uh, see, IT guys are not big on catching. All right, I figured that out a long time ago. Or. Oh. Note to self, do not enable the guy on the third row to get a prize. All right, last one. Name one of the L2 services I mentioned that can take advantage of the L2 tunnel. Right here. DHCP, right. So. Microtech Discovery, Roman, all those things. There you go. All right, thanks a lot for playing. Any questions? Yes, sir. I have a prize for you if you can tell me the answer to this question. So I've set up something very similar, uh, hub and spoke, layer two, and everything worked. All of the remote layer two clients showed up in the Winbox window. Starting with upgrading to 6.41, suddenly the remote ones all disappeared. Okay. I wrote to, I wrote to support. Oh, I, know, I know the answer. answer. What is the answer? <laughs> Uh, I think at 6.41, they changed something with uh, IP Neighbors. Now IP Neighbors relies upon interface lists. If you haven't found interface lists before, it's very much like IP address lists. So it used to be with IP Neighbors, there was a Discovery Interfaces button where you set the interfaces on which you wanted it to run IP Neighbors. Now it uses an interface list. The interface list can be dynamic interfaces. They can be static interfaces that you configure. I would say go into uh, IP neighbors, click discovery, and see if those interfaces are still there. Because if they were there in the default config and you remove them from a bridge, they'll now say unknown interface. And you'll just have to reset the interface there. I bet that's the problem. So what's my prize? More questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's a punishment. Do not RMA any of the prizes. <laughs> Have you found that uh, there's a limit to the, the number of ports you can add to a bridge? Like uh, the, yeah, I remember reading actually, that somewhere, but I don't know what the limit is. It's in the wiki, I'm pretty sure. I've done something similar with EOIP tunnels, and I ran into like, I think it was about 50, and it just completely broke everything as soon as it got to 51. Yeah. So I wasn't sure. I don't know if the new Router OS version with the hardware offloading helps that or, or not. Yeah, I, just want to yeah. See if you're I don't know the answer, but yeah, obviously there is going to be a limit. I feel a hard question coming. Uh, do you know if there's any protection built into this sort of layer two tunnel against things like broadcast loops and you know, storms and, and the usual sort of problems we have when we're extending layer two across you know, layer three networks or anything like uh, spanning tree would normally. Produce. Yeah, yeah, so sp spanning tree is there, rapid spanning tree, and now MSTP, is that right, MSTP? Yeah, so it's all built in, and uh, I believe that in 641, last time I looked, rapid spanning tree was now the default. So, so nothing built into the protocol itself, you would enable those at the remote end? You would enable spanning tree on the bridge interface itself, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Right here. Hardware encryption with L2TP? Mm 
Hmm. No, I do not. I do not know. That's a good job. Good question if, for Giannis Magus. If outside. you use the the default encryption profile, it turns on MPPE as well. So you're probably running that and IPsec. Okay. Thank you. Thank God, there's always somebody smarter in the room. Anybody else? All right. Thanks for playing along. Appreciate it.